Good morning, good morning. Oh, wow. Does anybody know what today is? It's Pentecost. Somebody ought to get excited because Pentecost is not just a holiday, it's an experience. And I'm so glad that I can say that I have experienced the power of Pentecost. It's Pentecost Sunday. Somebody ought to get excited about it. And one thing that makes it so unique this year is many of you that are watching and listening right now are watching and listening from your home. And when you understand what happened on the day of Pentecost, it happened at a home, it happened on a porch, it happened upstairs, it didn't happen in somebody's church. It didn't even happen in the main part of the temple. It actually happened in a place that was just big enough to hang out. And as believers were hanging out, holding on to a promise. Here's what the Bible said. Oh, I got to say that again. As believers were just hanging out, holding on to a promise. Is that anybody I'm talking to today that you're just holding on to a promise? This is what happened in Acts chapter 2 verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come when the time had been fulfilled. I love that concept based on Old Testament prophecies. When the exact time had been fulfilled, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, that's what I'm expecting. That's what's been happening the last couple of weeks. There have been suddenlies of conversion, suddenlies of financial breakthrough, suddenlies of families being reconciled, suddenlies of people finding freedom at the cross, even on Zoom connect group calls, or even watching virtually, or even just people meeting together now that we can get to a coffee shop one or two people together I'm getting testimonies of suddenlies and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting I could stop right there and we could begin to rejoice wherever you're sitting I want you to expect to feel the presence of the risen Jesus then there appeared to them uh, divided tongues or the King James says cloven tongues like as a fire and one set upon each one of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I love when they ask what's going on. They say, what meaneth this? I mean, can you imagine just showing up today if you were to drive up to the church and there's a group of us praying and you walk in and we're all talking different languages and all kind of things are happening. They just ask the question, what in the world does this mean? And I love what Peter said in verse 16. He said, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servant, on my maid servants, listen, you got this? I will pour out my spirit. I will pour out my spirit in those days. This is what's exciting to me. Pentecost is when we celebrate the birth of the church of Jesus Christ. But when I say church, so many people hearing that, when I say church, you see steeple. That would be a good rap song. When I say church, Okay, so, but that's not what it is. He said, upon this rock, I will build my ecclesia, my ecclesia. When Jesus said church, he wasn't talking about a social club. He wasn't talking about a steeple. He wasn't even talking about a building. He was talking about the, the concept that the apostle Paul taps into and said, our bodies are the temple. Our bodies are the carrier. Our bodies are the receptacles of the Holy Ghost. It is the birthplace of the possibility that you could become part of the body of God. You could become part of the body of Jesus Christ. It is the birthplace of the church, the true ecclesia, this kingdom concept that Jesus birthed by his own blood. It gets me so excited. I know at Pentecost Sunday, especially this week, we'll be talking about several things in the next few moments, but several years ago I was at a conference about the time of Pentecost Sunday and I was preaching the last message and it was on a Friday night. Pentecost Sunday was on Sunday and so I'm the last Friday night speaker and if you've ever spake at a conference or taught at a work symposium or something similar that pressure is on you because they're expecting you to extrapolate something that they've never heard. They want you to talk about a revelation or something that they've never received and it's full of preachers hundreds of preachers and they wanted me to preach and I had prayed, I had prepared and I had studied and I was in the hotel room kind of going through the motions, kind of preaching in my mind what I was going to say and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said why why are you praying for fresh wind and fresh fire when I'm still praying that you may be one? And he said, while the church is praying, you don't need a fresh Pentecost. You need a fresh revelation of reconciliation. 
You need a fresh revelation of oneness and unity. I feel like preaching to somebody right now. He said, because while people are walking around beating tambourines and drums and blowing trumpets and going on 40-day fast, wanting a new Pentecost, there will never be another. Every day is the day of Pentecost to the New Testament church. There will never be a duplication of the day of Pentecost. And he said, you're praying for fresh wind and fresh fire. I'm still praying that you may be one. I'm still praying that you be the church that I died to birth. And so while we're dreaming up new ways to have church, he is crying, heartbroken, waiting on us to be the church of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Takes me to the concept. It's, it's that word in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1 where it says one accord. It's also mentioned in another concept in verse 46. It's mentioned eight or nine times in the New Testament, but it's a Greek word uh, called homon. Homothemadon. There we go. Homothemadon. Does that sound better? It's hard for me to say Greek. I get my English, my French, and my redneck all mixed up. But, but it actually means in one accord. It's that word one accord. But here's, I looked up the definition. It describes people who share like precious faith, creating a God-produced unity between them when everything else about them is different. It was a New Testament word used in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. We want to jump to the spirit encounter without talking about the one accord principle. And I think today, before we talk about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we need to talk about that the spirit was not poured out until they were in one place in one accord. That is that Greek word in one accord, coming together in one mind together. They were united together. Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 far by one Holy Spirit. This is the Amplified. All week I have been messed up by the Amplified. For we are far by one Holy Spirit where we all baptize into one body. Say one spirit. Spiritually transformed, united together. There's that supernatural word of one accord. We were spiritually transformed, united together. Whether Jews or Greeks, Gentiles, slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one Holy Holy Spirit since the same Holy Spirit fills each life. So we are baptized. So here's my issue today. I don't believe that America simply has a race problem. I believe America has a sin problem. And I believe the answer to the sin problem is a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But we can't expect a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit until we fight to get into agreement and come into one accord again in one mind, in one place in one accord and we're focusing upon the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? So Jesus died to birth a church and I just want to tell you that while we are celebrating the day of Pentecost, it is the birth, it is birthing the infancy of the church. But before I can tell you about the church, the ecclesia, the kingdom of God, let me tell you what the church is not. The church is not a social club. It's not a place where you have to attain to a certain status, a certain color, a certain language, a certain finance in order to come into the kingdom of God. It's not a place either where we come to be entertained. It's not a place to come and to sit while somebody performs and talks to you about religion. Number three, it's also not an outpost for any certain political party. I am so tired of people trying to pull politics into the kingdom of God. There are people that are believers that will never be an American and their sons and their daughters fight in their armies coming and submitting to the law of God just like our sons and our daughters we're all praying for safety but bottom line take their flag away they're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ and by one spirit are we baptized into one body We are celebrating a supernatural element. I tell people all the time that I think that Koinonia may be the second most supernatural thing in the, in the church world outside of the baptism of the Holy Spirit because Koinonia is divine fellowship even when I disagree. It means I come into fellowship with you even when I disagree with you. I can be in unity because if I agree with everything you do, everything you say, everything you practice, and everything you believe, we are not in unity. We 
are in agreement. Unity can only be when we have a right to disagree, but we choose our family relationship to be able to come together at the foot of the cross. So the concept that I couldn't get away from today, and I, I, I really want to preach this, and I got to behave because we're online, and I don't want you to think I'm hollering at you in your living room. I don't want you to think I'm like sitting on your coffee table and I'm screaming at you, but the church of Jesus Christ is an ethnos. The word ethnos in Greek means nation or nationality. The church of Jesus Christ is its own nationality. It is its own ethnos. And for 2,000 years, hell has tried to separate the church from politics, trying to separate the church from social justice and reform, tried to separate the church on Sunday, that the most segregated place in the world are the steeple churches around the world. But I've come to tell you that the Bible teaches that this is a godly, holy nation and it is a holy ethnos. Let me prove it to you. Ethnos is the Greek word used to make and describe the church as one community made out of many nations. Here's the definition. It is many people who were not a nation, but now we have obtained mercy so that we are now a godly nation. Peter said it this way in 1 Peter 2 and 9, but you are, I wish you would just point at yourself, point at your children, point at your wife, point at your mother-in-law, point at your dog and say, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We say nation, you're, it's not just nation, it's not just a nationality, it's not just government, it's an ethnos, it's actually an ethnicity. You are a holy ethnicity. You are no longer what you, I thought we were born again. I thought we had become new creatures in Christ Jesus. I didn't think that we thought the same, talked the same, acted the same as people that are in the world. We are in the world, but not of the world. We are a holy nation. Hmm. His own, I love this, his own special people. His own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. See, the church is to be the example. The church of Jesus Christ, the ecclesia. I'm not talking about the steeple church. I'm not talking about the church of your grandma, your mom, and them. I'm talking about the theological power of a true holy nation that for 2,000 years, the remnant that has been in every tongue, every color, every tribe that has lifted up the blood-stained banner, that is what we are fighting for today to rediscover the power that the church has. Paul actually said this in Ephesians 3 and 10. Hold on, this scripture, <laughs> I don't have a wig, but it almost blew my wig off when I was reading this week, said to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. Wait a minute. You, the wisdom of God might be made known by the church. The only way that principalities and powers are going to know the wisdom of God is by the church. The the only way that they're going to know how God wanted the earth to be is by the church. It is the kingdom that will restore us to the authority that the blood of Jesus has already paid for. And somebody ought to get excited about it. So it shall be known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. So if you want to know what God had in mind, you have to discover what did he want the primitive New Testament church to be. I tell you from the day, I thought it's been all my life, but I've been talking to Pastor Alex, Pastor Stephanie. I have friends, men in our church, women in our church. I have pastors around America, and I'm telling you that the answer is a sin problem. It is a misrepresentation of the church of Jesus Christ. We are not a social club. We are not a denomination. We are not somebody that you have to jump through hoops to be a part of. We are an ethnic. We are a holy nation. We have been set apart unto God. We are special. We are peculiar. And we are holy. Uh, have you ever been to an American embassy? I know some of you served in the military. Some of you have been on mission field. And I don't want to get personal, but my sister could relate. Michelle is, we went to the American embassy just to buy Dr. Pepper. It was the only place in Cote d'Ivoire when we were teenagers that every once in a while they would get a fresh shipment, a boat would come in, an airplane would leave, and they would, at the embassy, you could go. And my dad was a Dr. Pepper pepper fanatic. I, he may have been addicted. I don't want to touch that, but he was a doctor and we would get Dr. Pepper. The problem is a lot of times when we would get it, it would be European canned Dr. Pepper and it didn't have the fizz kind of that well, we would go stand in line with other Americans. But the thing about the American embassy is if you ever get past the guard, once you get past the gate, once you get past the security check, hold on somebody, once they can confirm your citizenship, 
Once they can confirm your citizenship, when you step into that embassy, it's like a little bit of America in India, in Africa, in Russia, in the Middle East, wherever you are. When you step, it is because of the power of your citizenship. Jesus died so that his church could be an embassy in the earth. Jesus died so that when you step foot on Oasis campus, we don't see if you're a Hindu. We don't see if you're a Buddhist. We don't see if you're white. We don't see if you're Latino. We don't see if you're black. We celebrate your difference, but we don't make a distinction out of that. We accept you as a citizen of the kingdom of God because to say that we see no color would be a lie. We celebrate your color. We celebrate your difference. We celebrate your distinction, but realize that when you step on the ground of the kingdom of God, that we have come into diplomatic immunity. We have stepped into, you can't touch me. I step into the embassy. That's why we want children whose parents are abusing them step into the kingdom. We want ladies that are being abused step into the kingdom. We want drug addicts that are ravaged by drugs step into the kingdom. We want people that are broken politically and economically step into the kingdom because when you step into the kingdom of God, it's a little bit of heaven on earth. And we can shout about the embassy and being in America, but I want to talk about this world is not my home. I want to talk about this concept that I have this hope. Paul said, if I had hope in this life only, I would be of all men most miserable. But when I think about, that's the concept. I, I'm so grateful for heaven. I want to go to heaven, just not today. And what I tell people, instead of talking about what it's going to be like over there, why don't we begin to build bigger embassies down here? <laughs> why don't we begin to expand the kingdom down here? I wish you'd tell, it can start with me. It can start with my family. It can start with my friends. It can start in my career. It can start in my life. Because how is it possible for numbers of churches in our nation? Did you know that the numbers of, our ch of churches in our nation, church plants, are increasing almost every week, but the impact of the kingdom kingdom seems to be waning. So that means you can have churches and not have embassies. You can have buildings and not have refuges. <laughs> you can have space and not have safety. I, I got to keep preaching. I don't want to get sidetracked. But how can we have so much preaching, praising, and programs and yet demonstrate so little power? Because we have negated the one accord principle and we have not fought for one accord and we have not fought to believe that you must be born again of the water and the spirit. I still believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is an encounter, it's an experience, and every believer has the right right to receive that power you shall receive power after that the holy ghost is come on you if you believe that somebody ought to say amen so why does the church merely react to the society's agenda rather than offering a kingdom alternative or agenda for the society the answer is simply this it lies in the reality that the church today bears little resemblance to the kingdom from which we came because the modern church is based on preference and personality. And the church of Jesus Christ is a kingdom full of refugees. You didn't get that, did you? The modern church is full of preference. Well, I can't go there. They don't sing my kind of music. Well, I can't go there. I don't like the pastor. Well, I don't know if I fit there. You know, rich people go there. Poor people go there. Latino people go there. Uneducated. Well, that church has all these people with degrees. I don't feel. So we segregate according to our comfort when God has intentionally taught us to go into all the world and to intentionally infiltrate. Why? Because we are refugees. This world is not my home. So the kingdom of God is full of refugees that realize I am an American on my passport. But if you look at my my heart I'm a part of the kingdom and my kingdom ethnicity supersedes my American ethnicity my kingdom responsibility supersedes my patriotism I wish I could preach right now my kingdom responsibility is my primary see Jesus is not only Lord of Lords he is King of Kings and my submission to him is first. I feel like preaching today. I love this concept because this is, you say, well, well what are you saying, Pastor? What is the kingdom? What, why does this make so much sense? Why are you talking about it? Because it's in the Bible. It excites me that we're talking this week, and I'll be talking in the next few minutes about racial reconciliation. We're going to talk about the elephant. I refuse to not preach the elephant in the room today, but not from a secular agenda. I'm preaching the kingdom. I'm preaching theology. I'm preaching solutions. I've said it all week. I don't have all the answers, but I do know the solution. 
And it was birth, it was birth on the day of Pentecost. Here's what John writes in chapter 7 of Revelation verse 9. He said, after these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, and people. Hold on, let me do a station break. Can I just hurt somebody right now? People that say, oh, there won't be any race in heaven. Yes, there will. So I want you to know you're stuck with it. That God loves you so much. He created you who you are. So why are you ashamed of it? Why are you ashamed of it? Why are you putting it down? Because I saw a multitude of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white White robes with palm branches in their hands. Somebody ought to say, that's the heaven I want to be a part of. But why do we need to wait until you die? Why do we need to wait until the second coming of Jesus Christ? Jesus died so that for 2,000 years we would be a holy nation and that every tongue, every color, every tribe, every kindred, every gender, every race would be a part of the kingdom of God. Yet to be excited I, I love Pastor Mike Todd in Tulsa. If you don't watch him, I, I know he don't need any more followers, my Lord. I think he has more followers than any preacher in America, but he's worth following. I was out walking this week, and he started preaching to me, and he read this scripture, and he said, people are asking me, Pastor Todd, what, are you, what, is your, what do you want to say about racial reconciliation? He said, I have three words. It shall happen. It shall happen. And then he read that scripture. It shall. I don't care what hell tries to do. I don't care what the enemy tries to do. It shall happen a multitude of every tongue, every tribe, every kindred. Now, I said all that. It took about 12 minutes to get us to our introduction in the book of James. <laughs> because the reason I got into all that is we have to understand our study started last week. We're talking about essential services, and it, I, I couldn't help. We had someone else scheduled today. One of our other pastors was going to preach today, and when we got into everything this week, he called me and said, man, I don't feel comfortable because the second chapter of the book of James deals with prejudice. It deals with discrimination. I said, well, look at God. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? So let's go to the Word because James understood the incredible responsibility and opportunity. Say that, responsibility and opportunity to the people that were in the streets of Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost because it's these same people that I taught you last week when he talks about the, the 12 tribes that were scattered, that were dispersed. The people that were dispersed that James are writing to are the people and their children who were standing in the streets and were in the upper room and experienced the day of Pentecost. Oh, Holy Ghost. And they were dispersed with a responsibility and an opportunity to the uttermost parts of the earth. It kind of reminds me of the kingdom church today. We have a responsibility that once we get in one accord and once we experience Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is going to disperse us in places that don't look like us, that don't think like us, that don't even like us, that are going to persecute us, but he has placed us there not to be a, not to just gauge the temperature, not to be a thermometer, but to be a thermostat and to change the environment. I need somebody to not be a part of the problem, but you need to say, I will be a part of the solution. So this is why in chapter 1, we're going to go to chapter 2, but in chapter 1, he just simply says the whole synopsis of the book of James is this, that he reminds us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. He reminds these 12 tribes, these tribes of Israel that have received the Holy Spirit. They have seen miracles in the streets. They have heard the stories of Peter and John raising up cripples, the dead being raised. They know what has happened to them by experience. Then they are put into parts of the world that are completely anti-Christ and anti-their culture, and he tells them you need to become a doer of the word and not just a hearer only. That, <laughs> that takes us then to chapter 2 and verse 1. My fellow believers, do not practice your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of partiality, I'm reading in the Amplified, toward people. Show no favoritism, no prejudice, and no snobbery. I want to preach all by myself. Say, that's the Bible. For if a man comes into your meeting place wearing a gold ring, fine clothes, a poor man, dirty clothes also comes in. You pay special attention to the one who wears the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in this good seat and you tell the poor man you stand over there or sit down on the floor by my footstool. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judge with the wrong Motive. See, sometimes I think we need to understand the definition of terms. I just want to talk about this about two minutes, the definition of terms, because we confuse preference with prejudice. You can have a preference and not be prejudiced, but to be prejudiced means you prejudge. 
You have prejudged a person or a situation or a culture based on something that they have never validated by their mouth. You have never had it validated for truth, but you are prejudging them. So to be prejudiced means perceived opinion that is not based on reason or actual experience. So this is what I wrote down. I didn't get this out of a dictionary, but I think it's right. That prejudice based on difference alone is discrimination. Prejudice based, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're black or white, Latino, Asian, doesn't matter, where you are in the church of God. So James just jumps in the middle of this concept of discrimination, which means to make a difference based on somebody's differences. I wish I could preach. And then that takes us actually to racism. Racism is not just prejudice, but racism is prejudice plus power to deny a right or privilege that produces a disparity or disproportionality to a person, an individual, or a culture, or a people. When I had a phone call yesterday with one of my friends, it's a new friend I'm building a relationship with, way smarter than I, and he gave me a definition, and he said the problem that we're going on in our nation today is people don't seem to understand the difference between pride, preference, prejudice, discrimination, and racism. That just because you have an opinion doesn't mean it's a sin. It's when that opinion is verbalized and put, is put a yoke or causes someone else to be blind and causes someone else to be treated different than you. That is when it goes beyond being a preference. It becomes a prejudice, which leads to discrimination, which always leads to racism. Here's what he said racism was. It is discrimination of people based on skin color or ethnic origin. It involves the unrighteous use of power against people toward whom we harbor prejudice, which is the emotional foundation of discrimination. Tony Evans said it this way. I love to quote him because he's smarter than me. Racism is equally unrighteous, whether practiced by whites toward blacks, blacks toward Hispanics, Hispanics toward Asians, or any other combination. Therefore, it's an affront to the character of God. His answer to racism is never racism in reverse. I've come to tell you that people say that there's no such thing as racism at the foot of the cross. Well, that may be the only place because we are seeing this can are spread worldwide and it doesn't seem to be getting better. Do I have anybody that's willing to admit, don't try to defend the problem. This week, I've seen people trying to defend. Quit defending. Be quiet. Say, I want to listen. I want to weep. I want to hear. But I also want to defend and protect and make sure that everybody is treated the same in this nation. Not just this nation, but in the ethnic nation, this ethnos of the kingdom of God. You ought to clap your hands and give God praise because why has it been such a problem? It's because we are trying to make it a problem with society and not make it a sin problem. I'm about to prove to you biblically the book of James discrimination and prejudice is a heaven or hell issue and if we're going to talk about the day of Pentecost we have to talk about coming in one place in one accord and we have to pray that there's a Holy Spirit outpouring today and that the kingdom of God is supernaturally awakened. Does anybody feel it in your spirit that the kingdom of God is supernaturally awaken in Jesus name because once you admit that racism is a sin problem you're obligated as a believer to deal with it once you admit this is not society this isn't something I saw on the news this isn't just something tweetable this is not just a hashtag moment but that this is a sin issue, this is a church issue, this is a gospel issue, this is a believer issue, then we can begin to fight it spiritually and not just in the natural because we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We are fighting with rulers and principalities. And how did the apostle Paul say that rulers and principalities are going to know the wisdom of God? How are they going to know the opinion of God? By the church. By you and by me. I love what John in 1 John 2 and 9, the one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. Until now. Light is coming. It's not hopeless. Until now. So James begins to deal with the concept. So today I want to leave you with this concept of discrimination. It's because this is what he's talking about. So I want to go down to three things. There's three things that when people discriminate, they're making presumptions they're being presumptuous when they discriminate they're being presumptuous they 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 assume three different things number one they assume that discrimination is not a sin but here's what James says in chapter 2 verse 9 but if you show partiality the amplified says when it says partiality prejudice or favoritism you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as offenders partiality is sin number one 
we assume that discrimination is not significant. I don't think anybody that has a cell phone can think it's not insignificant today. But here's what he said in verse 10. For whoever keeps the whole law but stumbles in one point, he's become guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery but you murder, you have become guilty of transgressing the entire law. I thought it's been atrocious this week when I'm here people trying to drag the abortion fight into the racial justice fight. They're two separate fights. You can't justify one. You can't pull one in to try to defend anything. Why don't we just call sin, sin? Why don't we just deal with truth is truth, truth is a person, truth is Jesus, truth has a people, and I'm a part of that people, and the Bible is my law, and I am stepping into the kingdom of God based upon his word. Then number three, I, 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 you have to understand, number three, that discrimination is not serious. Verse 10 says this, for whoever keeps the whole law but stumbles in one point has become guilty of breaking it all. It is serious. So today, I didn't want to get you down, but I want to celebrate Pentecost. I want to celebrate the homoduthai principle. I want to celebrate the one accord principle because what he leaves us with in, in verse 13 of chapter 2, he says it this way, mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Years ago, one of my mentors told me, he said, as a pastor, you're going to be wrong. He said, just make up in your mind to always be wrong on the side of mercy. And he said, and if you're wrong on the side of mercy, you'll always be right in the eyes of God. It may not be the best leadership decision. It may not be the best business decision. It may not be the best decision as a spouse or a husband. Others may disagree with that decision. But in your heart, I'm not talking about weakness and meekness. I'm talking about mercy. If you truly err on the side of mercy, in the long term, you have obeyed the voice of God and done your best. So today I want to tell you that I'm praying for an outpouring and a baptism of mercy. Years ago at Oasis, when we launched Oasis Church, one of our hearts was to have communion every service. It was in our heart that every time we come together as believers, and a lot of people that are new to Oasis, because we have so many of our leaders and our pastors that are always teaching us and leading us in communion, I think they may miss the heart because I start, I think for the first couple of months, I did communion, then Alex did communion every service because it was so important to me. Because when Jesus tells his disciples to take the elements, he uses this word, when you do this, do this in remembrance. And I know that remember means to recall, but it also means to put back together what has been separated. So today, as you get your cracker, your Dr. Pepper, your tea, your biscuits, some of you may have a leftover Twinkie, whatever you have in your house, we sent out a little email, a little text, a little social media. We wanted you to be able to take communion today because here's what I want to pray on this day of Pentecost. I have to go back. I just want to go in, in my Bible. I like just sometimes reading from the Bible, not the iPad, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. They were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Today, in the midst of hurt, shame, discouragement, fear, discrimination, racism, and hatred, and sin, Jesus' body is still the answer. But maybe his body's been separated. Maybe you've been separated by somebody of a different color. Maybe even a different belief. Maybe a different lifestyle. Maybe a different political party. It's caused you to actually break fellowship as believers, as brothers, as sisters. It's caused you to treat one another different. It's called you to prejudge, to discriminate, or God forbid, maybe even by the color of someone's skin. You have the authority of the power to make decisions politically, economically that would malign them and keep them from their destiny and that's racism and so we're here today as what would happen at Oasis and we're going to do it right now but as we take the bread <laughs> here's what I believe today on Pentecost Sunday at homes all over this region at homes literally around the world our friends that are watching would you join with Oasis Church as we remember the body of Jesus through communion as we come and bring the body back as one holy 
ethnos. In Jesus' name, would you take the bread? today, Lord, whether it's grape juice, whether it's wine, whether it's iced tea or Dr. Pepper, people are at home and we didn't do the passing out everything today because this is personal. I don't want it to be about the elements. The elements not being correct simplify the diversity. It symbolizes the difference. People all over Oasis today are taking communion with different stuff because it's not about the stuff. It's about the body. It's about the uniting of the kingdom of heaven. So as we take the juice that represents his blood, if there be any hinge, if there be any sin, matter of fact, just stop for a moment. I want to pray. I want to pray right now. If there be any sin in your heart, sin of omission, sin of commission, but specifically discrimination, prejudice, and racism, It's on so many different levels. I've been repenting all week, and I repent with you. But I'm asking you right now, can I pray for you? And wherever you are, could we be a part? May you be a part as Oasis believers, as the sons and daughters of God. May Oasis step into the fight. And may we become a larger embassy of the kingdom of heaven. Lord Jesus, I repent. We confess We confess our hatreds, our discriminations, our preferences, our prejudice, our racism. We confess many times we may not have done anything. We've just stayed silent or we've ignored or we've not listened. We confess sin today. We repent of sin. People are listening right now may have never asked you to come into their heart. They may have never repented of their sins. Do that right now. Father, we just ask you, come fill my heart. Baptize me with your spirit. We pray for fresh wind in every home, in every life of Oasis Church, even now. (laughs) And as we take this juice, (laughs) everything that is not holy, everything that is not of Jesus, leaves my mind and my spirit, and I am renewed with you. And I can say with Paul, in you I live, in you I move, in you I have my very being. In Jesus' name, let's partake. (laughs) Thank you, Jesus. I love you, and I just want us to praise him all over this city, all over this region. Can we just raise your hands wherever you are? Just begin to thank him. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for a united church. I thank you for a united kingdom. I thank you that I am a part of the solution. Give us favor, give us grace, and we celebrate you in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you. God bless. See you next time.